Well, welcome back to Sublime. Before I dive into everything and you begin to find out what this thing is, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this place. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. We ask, Father, that your word would be spoken tonight, that they would not hear from me, Father, that they would hear from you. Your word is the only thing that can change a life, and I find that out more and more every single day. And I thank you, Father, that you put up with me and that you are patient with me. Thank you that you are patient with all of us in this room. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit and that your word would be spoken. I'm pleading for you, Father, to speak tonight. And it's in your son's name that we all pray. Amen. So, last week, oh, actually, let me address the visitors in the room. I, I always want to do that. If you're a visitor in this room, we say welcome. We're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, there, as I always will say, there's a lot of things that you could be doing. And that goes for everybody that's returned as well. There's a lot of things that you could be doing, but you've chosen to pause in your week to be here tonight, and we are grateful that you are here. If you are a visitor and you're just getting to know people, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Michael. I'm the student pastor here at North Metro. And as I was about to say, last week we started this series called 100, which is all about having a real relationship with Jesus Christ. What, what does it take for you to put that emoji right behind your relationship with Jesus? What does it take to make it an authentic, real relationship with Jesus. And I said, in order to have that, you have to have real conversations. You have to have the conversations which you would tag 100 behind. And so that's what we started last week. And I told you a story about a relationship. And I, I used that story as a catalyst to make one simple point, that relationships take work. All across the board, every person's life, if you have a relationship in your life that you value, then you know eventually, or you've already found it out the hard way, that it takes some level of work to actually keep that relationship going, be it a friendship, be it a dating relationship, even a relationship with your parents. I mean, you're difficult to get along with and your parents are difficult to get along with. And if they're worth it, which I hope they are because they are worth it, uh, you have to put in work and you have to put in a lot of energy and you have to put in time. And, you know, it goes that way for a marriage as well. You know, you love each other, but after a while you can get on each other's nerves. And I've been married for six years and I know my wife probably from day one has said, you're getting on my nerves. And she has put in a lot of work to deal with me. But in the end, every relationship requires work. But if the person is worth it, the work is nothing but worth. That's all it is. It's all worth to you. I told you a story last week of my boy Aaron who uh, got broken up with by his girlfriend and they've been dating for almost eight years. And he worked to get her back. And it was a lot of days and a lot of weeks and a lot of months and a lot of just doing everything he possibly could to get Ryan back. And he did. And they've been married now, happily married for five years. But Aaron would tell you the work was completely worth it. The relationship was worth the work. The same is true with your relationship with God. I said to you last week, the reason why I brought that up and I told you the story of Aaron and Ryan is to illustrate the point that if the person, even in this case, God is worth it, so is the work. The work is worth it, but it takes work. It takes work. You know, one of the most interesting relationships, the strange, not interesting, because it really wasn't interesting. It's just strange. One of the strangest relationships I was ever in was the summer of my 10th grade year. So the summer going into my junior year, I started dating this girl. It was not a long relationship because it was weird and it was strange. It ended fast. It did not last. We maybe made it a month. Maybe. We loved each other. It just didn't work out. So we had known each other all our life, practically. We had probably known each other, I would say, probably since preschool. She was a little bit younger than me, but we had known each other for a while. So that being said, this particular summer, I don't know what happened, I really don't. I couldn't tell you what happened. All I know is I ended up liking her and she ended up liking me. So we, we I, you know, at least for me, I didn't pick up on social cues from girls for a long time. I was just, and maybe a lot of the guys feel that way in this room because you don't, you don't understand the female. Well, females don't understand you either. That being said, um, it took me a little while to, to catch on that she liked me and she knew I liked her, I suppose. Well, I eventually asked her out. The moment I asked her out, everything got weird. That's how relationships work, right? Have you, have you ever been in one of those situations where during the liking stage, everything was good? The dating stage was weird. Those relationships don't make it. And if they do make it, you're miserable. We liked each other. Everything was great. The moment we started dating, I, I remember having somewhat of this thought right here. Yeah, I didn't think this one through. Didn't think this through at all. Yep, mm -mm. Didn't, didn't give much thought to this. I just liked her and we dated. And we broke up after a month. 
I mean, we didn't make it even to the new school year. Like right when school started, we broke up. And I look back at that relationship and I wonder, what made the relationship so strange? Like, I, I'll tell you, I have a history with dating. I call myself a serial dater. I dated a lot in high school. I can't, like, I was actually, um, the reason why I remember this story, I had actually forgotten all about this story. And one day when I was actually trying to think, like, what would be a good relationship story to tell you guys? And I was, like, getting ready to go to bed, and I was like, Candace, I never told you about so-and-so, which was a very bad idea. She's like, oh, who's that? It was just another girl that I had dated, which was not a good conversation before you go to bed. But nonetheless, I was like, well, I was in 10th grade. It's not that big of a deal. Just let it go. But I told her this story, the reason why I forgot it, it was weird. And I look back and I'm like, what made the relationship weird? Couldn't figure it out. Kept thinking about it. I was like, what made this relationship so strange? And then if I'm going to be real honest, I kind of, I think I figured it out. I think I figured out, and it's slightly embarrassing. It's actually very embarrassing. But um, I think I figured out what made this relationship awkward. As I said, I was in 10th grade going into 11th grade. So I was a junior. Um, she was in 8th grade. Mm-hmm. Eighth grade. She's going to the ninth. Just chill out. Y'all just chill out. Just calm down. Just calm down. Because the reality is, it's fine for a ninth grader to date a junior, but the moment a sophomore dates an eighth grader is just weird. It is. It's weird how that happens, but it's true. And I admit it. It was weird. It was bad. That's why my little girl will never date anybody. But let me rope bro- this back in. The reason why it was weird is our age gap. I am driving and I have two jobs. She's going into high school. And I mean, no offense to anybody that's an eighth grader or a freshman in here, but the juniors and seniors in here, you are in the same stage of life, but they are exiting that stage of life that you're now entering in. It's a little bit different. You're in the same stage, but things are changing. And there's nothing more clear to me now when I look back at this weird, odd relationship of a month why it was so strange? We couldn't talk. I, I swear she probably thought I was speaking Chinese. She never understood what I was saying, and I never understood a word that she was saying. But beyond the gender gap, there was this whole miscommunication thing. We could not get on the same page. I swear there were times where I looked at her cross at her, and I'm like, I don't have a, I know you're speaking English. I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand why you're acting this way. And she felt the same way about me. The reality was we were just on different spectrums. We were growing up, but we didn't know how to communicate. Communication, in my opinion, is the backbone to every relationship, every successful relationship. It's also the downfall to every relationship. I never forget, I never realized this more until I got married. When I was in, when we were engaged, my wife and I were engaged, we went to premarital counseling. If you don't know what that is, it's basically uh, to help you figure it out if you're actually going to make it or not, is how I describe it. Um, or you can work out the kinks in, in the relationship before you get married, and then they're like embedded in there. And so we went through premarital counseling, and it was great. We learned a lot about ourselves. We had a lot of unspoken expectations that we needed to work out. But one of the things in the first session the counselor said to me, and he said to Candace, was this. Every argument, every conflict, every disagreement can be boiled down to miscommunication. Everything. Everything will be boiled down to communication, even if it's, if it's something that uh, it doesn't even seem to relate to the way you talk to one another. In the end, it will always go back to communication. Poor communication will always lead to a poor relationship. So when you see a phenomenal marriage and you're like, oh, I would love one day to be, to be old and married like that, what you're looking at is not two just compatible people. You're looking at two people that know how to talk to one another. They have learned the art of communication. I truly believe it is an art and it's a learned art and it takes time. When you see two good friends, you're looking at people that have the same interests, they, have, they, they understand one another, but what they really get is how to talk to one another. The best friends understand language. They understand their communication. And in fact, the best of friends actually don't even have to say words and they already know what the other person's thinking. That's how close they are. The same is true in a good dating relationship. If you've got an awesome dating relationship, or you see an awesome couple and you're like, man, I would love to be more like that. I would love it to be in a dating relationship more like that. What you're looking at is not just two people that like each other and, and love each other. You're looking at two people that understand how to talk. The same is true with our relationship with God. 
Communication is the backbone to your relationship with God. And if you have poor communication with God, you will have a poor relationship with God. In fact, I will say this much to you. I think majority of Christians have a bad relationship with God because they don't know how to communicate with him. They have no idea how to communicate with him. And I'll say this much. It is pretty hard to communicate with somebody that's not right there in front of you. you, you kinda, if you've been in church for a little while, you kind of know what I'm talking about. We're kind of talking about prayer. Most people are terrified of prayer or they hate prayer because it's like talking to a wall and you're like, it's, it's not working. I'm praying and it's going nowhere. There's no interaction. You get no facial expression. There's no tone of voice. There's no voice whatsoever. And you're like, how am I supposed to communicate and talk to somebody that's not even there? Prayer often, it seems blank and meaningless and it's a pain because you don't feel like anything's happening. It's the people that have learned to deal with that and have learned to push through that that actually have great relationships with God because they've learned how to communicate with him and they've learned how to look beyond the feeling of like, hey, I'm just talking to a wall. If I talk to a wall, I'll hear faster, I'll hear my voice faster than I'll hear God talk to me. That's how it feels sometimes when you pray. It feels like it's going nowhere. The question is, how do we communicate with God? How do we talk to this person, this being, this ultimate creator of the universe? How do we talk to someone greater than us that is not right here next to us and we can't see their face, we can't hear their voice? How do we talk to someone like that? The great thing about that is, I've told you for the past, I think, five weeks, I've brought them up and off and on. I brought up these 12 disciples, the the original 12 that followed Jesus. I want you to know something about them. They were just like you, just like you. In fact, it was actually weirder for them than it is for you to follow Jesus. I mean, Peter and his brother were in a boat and Jesus comes up to them and said, hey, follow me. And they just stopped what they were doing and they started following Jesus. The same thing happened with James and John, another two set of brothers. Hey, follow me. And they just started following Jesus. They hadn't heard about him. They didn't know about his reputation. Just this random stranger comes up and says, hey, follow me. Granted, I will give credit where credit is due. It's the voice of God talking to you. I'm sure you'll respond a little differently when Jesus himself literally talks to you. But all I'm saying is they didn't know who he was. And so they randomly just start following this guy. And most of the disciples were just like Peter, James, and John. They just, Jesus comes up to them. It's like, hey, follow me. And so they, they leave their family. They leave their jobs. And they just start following Jesus. For years, they did that. And you can imagine as they followed Jesus, like you and I do, the more confirmation they got that Jesus was God. But the more confirmation you get that Jesus is God, especially when you see Jesus do the miraculous, like, hey, let me lay my hands on a blind person, and hey, now they can see. Hey, this person is crippled and a paraplegic. Let me actually just touch them, and they can stand up and walk. You begin to ask the question, how did you do that? Why did you do that? Why didn't you do that? The more the disciples followed Jesus, the more questions that were raised, so to speak. And the more they followed him, the more they got confused. Well, Jesus often would disappear in the middle of the day. He would also disappear in the middle of the night. Jesus was, you know, he'd just vanish. He'd be gone. The reason why he would disappear is he wanted to be alone. He wanted to go pray and talk to God. Well, the disciples began to pick up on the fact that Jesus communicated with God as if he knew God, as if he could talk to God one-on-one, as he would talk to his best friend. And that puzzled the disciples. And it just so happens one particular day, they had their opportunity to ask Jesus a very interesting question. And they made a request. And it's this. It's in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. I want you to see their question. It's a question we're asking. Once Jesus was in a certain place, praying, as I just told you. And as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. Now I'm going to stop there for a minute. They've watched Jesus do the incredible. They, at this point, they have probably watched Jesus walk on water and speak to a storm and the storm calms down. They know Jesus can do the incredible. They know he can do the miraculous. But what they're asking is not a miraculous thing. They're saying, how do you talk to God? Why do you talk to God like you know him? Why do you talk to God in such a way that he's your friend? How do you have that relationship with God? And I can imagine as these disciples have been following Jesus for years, Jesus is in his mind saying they finally are asking a good question. They're asking a very hard question, but it's a very good question. And I can imagine Jesus smiling at them and he replies and he says this in verse two. He says this, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Now, let me just kind of go through this real quick, you, real quick with you. Um, 
If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard this. You've heard it a lot. I remember being raised in a United Methodist church. I had to learn this. I had to repeat this. It'd be like we had one of those old school bulletins, and I'm not knocking on a Methodist church or any conservative church, like traditional church. Like, I am not knocking on them. But I remember in the bulletin, there would be certain Sundays where it would say the Lord's Prayer. Catholic churches do it too. It says the Lord's Prayer. And you would actually, the, the leader or the pastor or whoever was up front, he would say, let's all stand and say the Lord's Prayer. And I remember learning the Lord's Prayer and saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. That's what we had to learn. I still know it, surprisingly. I still know it. It's like, it's like the Pledge of Allegiance to us. We learned it, but I didn't know what it meant. And so the disciples were very much like me and very much like many of us in this room. If we've been raised in church, you've read and heard the Lord's Prayer, and a lot of you in this room know it, and maybe you don't. But I'll tell you this much, when the disciples heard that, they're like, oh, so what we do is we say what you say. If we say the Lord's prayer, our Father who is in heaven, who is holy, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we say those things, we're praying and we'll have that relationship that you have with God. Now keep in mind, these 12 disciples have been raised in Judaism. They are religious people. Now, they're not the best religious people, but they've been raised in religion. And so to them, prayer is nothing more than repeating a few words that God has already told them to say, or Jesus is telling them to say, or the priest told them to say. And so they're like, oh, so if we just repeat that, we're praying. And Jesus is like, no, no, you're not getting it. Yes, you asked me how to pray, but I want to show you why you pray. I want to go deeper. I want to look at the root of prayer. He said, you're missing it. And so Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, tells them a story. But I don't want to read you the story. I want to bring it into a modern context, and I want to apply it to you. This would be the story, the parable, the the analogy that Jesus would say to you, a modern generation. Just picture this. Every single one of you in this room. In the middle of the night, a friend shows up at your house knocking frantically. You and your family wake up. And your parents go downstairs and your dad or your mom looks through like the little people on the door or looks like if it's like at my house, you have two glass windows on the side of your door, looks out and realizes it's your best friend. And so they unlock the door and they let your friend in. They're like, why are you here? And you see your friend and you hug them and you embrace them, but you're very perplexed and confused as to why they're there. But you invite them into your living room and you sit down and your mom and dad are like, we'll leave you alone so you can catch up. And so as you're catching up, you realize that your friend is hungry and you realize that they're tired and that they're thirsty. And so what you do is you migrate to the kitchen and your friend comes with you like, let me get you something to eat. Let me get you something to drink. And so you grab a, a glass out of the cabinet and, and you go over to the refrigerator and you get some water and you're still talking, you're catching up. But the big question is, why are you here? But you don't want to make things awkward. You don't want to cut to the chase. You just want to kind of want to ease your way in. You keep talking. But then you realize that your friend is starving. And so you go over to the pantry and all you realize is you have a bag of chips. That's all you have is a bag of chips because your mom and dad didn't go to Costco yesterday. So you you just got chips. And so you realize I can't just give them a bag of chips. I can't just give them a snack. They're hungry. They need food. But you still give them the chips to just kind of hold them over. But what you do is you grab your phone because one of your other best friends lives right next door. And you grab your phone and you text them and you say, hey, I am so sorry to bother you in the middle of the night, but this friend of mine out of town, best friend, grew up together. They're here. I don't know why they're here. You start gossiping. Like, I don't know why they're here. Something's wrong. I can tell something's wrong. You want to help me? But you just keep talking through it. You keep texting. You're like, hey, can I come over? I know where the key is to your back door. Can I come over and get some food to feed them? Because mom and dad didn't go to Costco. You send that text. Maybe not that long. But you send that text. And you wait a few minutes and your friend texts you back like, what? See, go to bed. Like, give them the chips and go to bed. Like, talk to them, go to bed, give them a snack, go to bed. Leave me alone. I'll see you in the morning. Well, you're not satisfied with their answer. Like, seriously, something's wrong. I want to take care of my friend. I need some food. I don't want to barge into your house. I know where the key is to the back door. Just let me come in. Your friend texts back, seriously, go to bed. Leave me alone. It's too late. It's too early. It's at that time. It's it's just that it's the wrong kind of day friend texts you back. You're not satisfied with that. You text them back. The dialogue keeps going back and forth. And eventually your friend caves. Whatever. Get the key from under the mat. Help yourself to the pantry. If the dog bites you and you get caught and you set the alarm off, not my problem. And so you go over there and you get the food. 
And Jesus tells a story like that to the disciples, obviously not in a modern context, but he tells that story to the disciples. And he says this after he tells them the story in verse eight. He says, but I tell you this, though he, being the friend, won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Luke 11, eight through 10. So Jesus tells that story and then he explains the story. And the disciples are like, oh, I get it. So if we keep saying the Lord's Prayer over and over again, God will give me what I want. I get it. So what we need to do is repeat, 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 repeat. That's what you mean by persistence. And Jesus is like, you're really not getting it, are you? You're missing the whole thing. You're missing all of it. So Jesus is like, you know what? I'm not gonna tell you a story this time. I'm gonna gonna give you a life example. I'm gonna give you an illustration from your life because he was talking to 12 men that were likely all fathers or they had a father at one point in time. So they understood a connection that a father and a son had. And he says this starting in verse 11. He says this, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Of course, uh, or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, you ha- will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? As most of you know, I'm a dad. This is my little boy, Jackson. I'll show you a picture of him. If you've never seen my son, this is Jack. Jackson clearly is a stud. And when he's 16, he will not be allowed to leave the house either because I can't deal with that. Um, Fatherhood is a very special thing. Jackson will be four this October, so in one month, my little boy will be four. And he's my firstborn, and I'll never forget, you know, when he came into my life, it just, it wrecked everything in all the right ways. It was such a very, very special moment. But now I'm a daddy of two, and, and I love it. But Jackson's gotten older now, and Jackson's got a very big vocabulary. And Jackson is a talker. But he's a thinker too. He, I mean, if you were to ever babysit, babysit him, he would pull one over on you like that. He would get away with it too. And if, he, and if you wanted to discipline, he would just smile at you and still get away with it. That's just Jackson. But that being said, as Jackson's gotten older, our conversations have gotten very interesting and they've gotten more complex and they've gotten deeper. But Jackson's newest thing right now is he's got a statement and it's always the same statement. Daddy, I wanna tell you something. And he says it all the time. Daddy, I want to tell you something. It'd be like, for example, Daddy, I want to tell you something. What's that, buddy? 1819 is a huge number. Yes, it is, Jackson. Why did you choose 1819? It's just big. I'm, 1819, by the way, is the number he's fixated on right now. Daddy, I need to tell you something. What's that, Bubba? I call him Bubba as well. What's that, Bubba? Do um, you remember that time we fixed the sprinklers? I do, Jackson. Why? That was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, it was, Jackson. It was a lot of fun. We got in the mud and there were bugs. Yeah, there wa- you're right. There was mud and there were bugs. You're right. Daddy, I need to tell you something. In two days, he doesn't do two like this. He does it like this. He'll be great with math because he gets the ad. In two days, we're going to Nana's. Uh, well, in two weeks, yep, yeah, two days, two days, Dad. You're right, Jackson, two days, we're going to Nana's. It's really in 10 days, but in two days, we're going to Nana's. Are you excited, Jackson? Yeah, I'm so excited. What are you excited about? I'm gonna drive my Jeep and I'm gonna sit with Nana. And those are the conversations we have. And sometimes it'd be like, Dad, I need to tell you something. What's that, Jackson? Um, I'm thirsty. <laughs> Great, can I get, do you want something to drink? Yeah, what would you like, Jackson? Chocolate milk. Okay, great, got your chocolate milk. Our conversations like that are sometimes very silly and very childish, but to me, they're very special. They're very sweet. And and as he's gotten older, the conversations just continue to deepen and get more and more special. I'll I'll never forget 
we recently had a conversation. We have a bedtime routine, and I typically Candace gets to put Jackson to bed along with Elena because they just want mom to put them to bed. But I get, I would say every other day to every two days, Jackson is all about dad putting him to bed. And so it's this one particular night, Jackson and I uh, had just finished reading Pete the Cat. If you're a parent, you know what Pete the Cat is. If you're not a parent, you don't know what Pete the Cat is. But we just finished reading Pete the Cat about his groovy tennis shoes. And we close the book. And as we normally do, we turn off the lights. And I am the dad that lays in bed with his kids till they fall asleep because they're only little once. And so I'm not wasting that opportunity. So I lay there until he falls asleep. And sometimes he falls asleep right on my shoulder. And I love it. But we're laying there, and he's got these, like, planets and stars on his wall. And then we turn on this, this little, like, turtle light, and it shoots stars on the ceiling. And we just lay there, and sometimes we talk. But a lot of times we'll go, and I'll say that every night we have to pray. And I say, Jackson, what are we going to pray about? And it's always a list of things we're thankful for. Well, Mommy, Daddy, my toys, Reagan, Reagan, their dog, Elena. Sometimes he forgets Elena, and I have to remind him of Elena. <laughs> What about your sister? Um, or he'll go like Mimi, Poppy, and forget mom and dad. It's like, what about mom and dad? Mimi, Poppy, Nana, Pop. And sometimes he'll say his friend Caleb. And it's always a list. And I always say, okay, are you ready to pray? And I would say eight times out of 10, Jackson will say, yes, daddy. Sometimes he'll say no, he wants to go to bed. But this one particular night, I'm like, Jackson, you ready to pray? And instead of saying, Jack, instead of saying yes, Jackson starts praying. And he goes, Jesus, I can't go through this. Thank you for daddy. Thank you for mommy. Thank you for Reagan. And he just keeps going. And I can't keep going because I'm going to be a hot mess on this stage. But he keeps going. I mean, I was crying in bed. I was like, he's like, are you okay? And I was like, I'm great, buddy. Great. (laughs) But it's so special when your little boy starts praying because Jackson gets it. He gets it. He gets prayer because for Jackson, prayer is just talking. And that's all prayer is. It's interesting that a child can get prayer. But as adults and as teenagers, when we get older, we start to move away from what prayer really is. See, to Jackson, prayer is nothing more than a conversation between him and a loving father in heaven. That's to Jackson what prayer is. And biblically speaking, that's what prayer is. And he gets it. And it's taken a lot of time to get him there. But Jackson's starting to talk to his father in heaven. He doesn't need daddy to talk to him on his behalf. But like I said, as we get older, we start to move away from that. And we don't see God as a loving father anymore. We start to see him as something else. We start to see him as something like this. So if I can get all the tape off this thing. There's a lot of tape. We had to cover it up. We, we, we start to see God far more like a vending machine. Now, granted, I know this isn't a perfect vending machine, so believe it or not, by the way, vending machines aren't easy to come by. So I had to jack the refrigerator from downstairs. Actually, I didn't. Zach and Lucas did. Thank you, guys. Um, But this is what we treat God like, a heavenly vending machine. That's what we do. We no longer see him as a loving father. We start to migrate to this mentality. We start to see him as this thing that just gives us what we want. And see, the thing is, nobody has a relationship with a vending machine. And if you do, you should probably get help. (laughs) We're saying immediate help. Nobody has a relationship with this thing. If you do, get help. This thing isn't designed to have a relationship, but you were. By creation, you were designed to have a relationship with the Father in heaven. You were designed to have a relationship with God but often we replace God with something like this. See, a vending machine has one central purpose, to give you what you want. It gives you a list of preferences, a list of things that you could get, and you go in, you plug the code in, and you reach in, and you get what you want, and then you walk away. That's what you do. 
The same is true with our relationship with God. We only come to him when we need something. We put in the code, we pray, we wait, arms crossed because we don't have much time or patience. And then when we get what we want, we just walk away. We come to God when we need something. When our boyfriend breaks up with us, grandma gets cancer, mom and dad are going through a divorce. Those are the times we show up with God. Those are the times that we come to God and are like, God, I need you. But outside of that, we have no relationship with him. We have no contact with him. This is it. Thank you for being my heavenly celestial vending machine and we walk away. See you later when I get cancer. That's how we act. And I'm not saying that you would publicly ever say that, but that's how we act. We don't mean to do this, but we do it all the time. We treat God far more like a vending machine than we do a loving father. And I can say as a dad, if Jackson saw me as a means to an end, that would devastate me because he and I were designed to have a relationship with one another. And see, a vending machine is a means to an end to get your satisfaction. If Jackson saw me that way, that would wreck me. I wouldn't stop being his daddy and I wouldn't stop loving him, but I would know what we're missing out on. I would long for the silly conversations. I would long to hear about Hotel Transylvania 2 a thousand times a day. I would long to hear about the sprinklers. I would long to hear about, hey, daddy, can we watch The Good Dinosaur? Hey, daddy, can we watch this? Hey, daddy, can we do this? I, I, would, I would long for those moments because those things are special. I would long for that relationship. Because if Jackson just saw me as a wallet or as this thing to give him what he wants, that's not a relationship. And unfortunately, this is how we see God. But God wants a relationship with us. He's like, I don't want you to see me as this thing that just gives you what you want or gives you what you need. I want you to see me as your father because that's what I can be for you. And the truth is, if you call yourself a Christian, scripture is littered in the New Testament and it says you are his adopted daughter or his adopted son. And he sent his own son to make that way for you. He sacrificed his own individual son so he could adopt you. He exchanged his son so he could get you. Yet we still treat him like this. Oh God, grandma's got cancer. I, I, need, I need help. Grandma, you know, oh God, she's got cancer. Help me. And grandma gets healed of cancer. And you're like, see you later. You walk away with your Dr. Pepper or whatever it is that you like, your bag of chips, and you're done. Is that a relationship? No. Can you imagine dating somebody that saw you as a vending machine? No. Can you imagine having a friend like that? No. You want to know why? Because you would leave them. In fact, some of you have ended dating relationships and ended friendships because this is how they saw you. They only show up when they got a problem, right? Lord knows we all have plenty of those friends. They only come texting like, I got drama. I need help. I need some advice. You're like, hey, where you been when I needed help? This is what they treat you like. And you end that relationship because it's not a relationship. Why would we say otherwise about our relationship with God, with Jesus? Sublime, it's not a relationship if this is God to you. It's not a relationship. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. What I'm saying is you can't call it a relationship. You just got a connection with your vending machine, which is weird in and of itself. You wanna have a real honest 100 conversation about what it looks like to have a 100 relationship with God? If this is your God, you don't have a relationship with him because you're not communicating with your vending machine. You just plug in the code, get what you need and walk away. That's not a relationship. Sublime, here's what I'm getting at. We have got to stop treating God like this like a vending machine. And we've got to start talking to him like he's our loving father. He wants to hear about your crap. He wants to hear about your drama. He wants to hear your praise. He wants to hear the good. He wants to hear the heartache. He wants to hear the good things going on in your life. He wants to hear the bad things going on in your life. He does want to fulfill your needs. He does want to give you what you want. But the truth is, 
as a father, I can say this. There are times where Jackson asks for stuff that he doesn't need and it's not good for him and I do say no, but a loving father will say no. And if you see him as a vending machine, you can't take the no because you think he's being mean to you. That's why a lot of people don't like prayer. We have got to stop treating God like a vending machine and start talking to him, having a conversation with him like he's a loving father. It's not about a posture. It's not about your position. It's not about how many times you repeat the same words. It's not about how good you are at praying. It's about can you talk to God like you talk to anybody else? Because my son gets it and he's almost four. But as we get older, we start to migrate away from that mentality. Is God really a means to your end? That's not good if it's the truth. And I'm, I'm, I'm here, here's what I'm saying. You need to evaluate that. If you want that authentic relationship with God, you wanna say, hey, my relationship with God is 100, then you've gotta evaluate, is this God to you? Is he this heavenly vending machine that just gives you what you want? I hope not. Because you're missing out. You're missing out on something that's far greater than a vending machine. Because what happens when the vending machine runs out? It's a sad day. Because it doesn't meet your needs anymore. And you just move on to something else that will try to meet your needs. And a lot of you live that way. Last week, I, I pushed this 20-day challenge on you to read the Bible, and I'd love to push 20 days of prayer on you, but you know, I have an interesting conclusion about the 20-day challenge. A lot of you had a, a, a complaint or a, and granted, it wasn't one that was verbalized to me directly, but it was, it was things that I was able to pick up on, like, why don't you read your Bible? And the common excuse, yes, I used the word excuse, was, I'm busy you know what, I'll be the first youth pastor to admit it. Because most won't. Most adults and parents won't admit it because they're like, oh, they're not busy. They don't know what busy is. They haven't gotten to adulthood. You know what, your generation is the busiest generation of teenagers yet. But so is the rest of society. We're all busy and it's only getting faster. But you gotta learn to deal with it. It's sad I will be the first to admit this. My background, part of my background is in counseling. I pity the way the gen this generation is being treated because you are so scheduled, you don't even get to be a teenager anymore. And that breaks my heart for you, but that's the world we're living in right now. But that doesn't mean that you can't pray. It doesn't mean that you don't have time. When I hear you're too busy, I wonder, like, are you really too busy? How much time you spend on Snapchat today? Because your story says you got plenty of time. How much time do you watch TV a day? How much time do you spend playing sports? How much time do you spend doing nothing? But you need that nothing. And this might be a little offensive, but I'm gonna ask it and you don't need to respond because you don't wanna respond because it embarrasses you. How much time do you spend making out with your girlfriend? I know that's good. you got time to do that. Just saying, you got time for what you want to do. You ha I have time, I have time to waste, we all do. It's not that we're too busy, most of us just don't care. And I have been there. There are times where I don't feel like praying, even though he's my loving father. But we can't keep saying we're too busy. We're not too busy. We can make the time for the things we want because I can tell you right now, the amount of people that start praying when crap hits the fan, they have time. Your boyfriend breaks up with you. You get caught doing something you weren't supposed to do. Mom and dad come walk in, looking at, find you looking at porn. Oh, you pray fast. Oh God, I don't know what's gonna happen. You start biting your nails. You start praying quick. He's like, oh, where you been? Well, 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 you're back, aren't you? It's been about two years. That's not good. He loves you. Loves you. You could be the most annoying person on the planet and he say, I'm so excited that you're awake. Let's talk. You could be the most socially awkward person and he wouldn't run away from you. He created you and he loves you. We've got to move away from this. 
We've got to stop treating him like this means to an end, like this vending machine that just gives us what we want. And we've got to go to him and say, I know you will give me what I need, but I want to have a conversation with you. I want to have a relationship with you. If you don't talk to God, that's why your relationship is sour. If you don't talk to God, that's why your relationship is weak. If you don't talk to God, that's why your relationship is going nowhere with God. Sublime, if you're going to be the generation that speaks up where you are and you're going to show that God is important, you've got to show your friends and you've got to show people that call themselves Christians that God is not to be treated like this and that an authentic relationship with Jesus doesn't just treat him like a vending machine. And when you don't get your way, you're not sour about it. Sublime, here's what I'm calling you to do. I'm not calling you to just read your Bible to read your Bible, and I'm not telling you to pray just to pray. What I'm saying is if you want a real relationship with Jesus, you need to evaluate if this is your God. And if it is, you need to move away from that. And you just need to start the conversation, and it doesn't need to be weird. I encourage you, if if you drove here tonight, especially if you're an upperclassman, and if you drive home by yourself tonight, one of the greatest places you can pray is in your car while you're going home. Talk to him like he's right there with you. And I'm not saying be Carrie Underwood and say, take the wheel, Jesus. But what I am saying, what I am saying is just talk to him like he's there. Move away from this sublime. Move away from this. Talk to him like he's your father. Let me pray for you.